We begin here in Nigeria, where two days after an explosion killed over 100 people in Abezi community of Ohaji Egbema Council area of Imo states in southeastern Nigeria, the number of dead has increased, with the whereabouts of many still unknown. Correspondent Ovita George reports. We drove through a narrow path in the bush. When it became too narrow for vehicles, we got a motorcycle with the rider promising to take us to the site of the explosion. I am somewhere in a forest in Abezi community of Ohajebema local government area of Imo State where tragedy struck on Friday the 22nd of April. Black Friday they call it. Now this is a typical example of a loading bay where people come to buy products that is petroleum products, they call it black market within the Nigerian speech community. Now, look at this. This vehicle is burnt, and there are other ones also burnt in this particular location. Now, we understand also that those who actually died were not just those doing this business. They call it business in this place. Few persons are willing to give information, but we got that information quite right. They come here to do business, and those who are also here to buy the products were also consumed by the fire. Now, look at this. It is cellophane. I asked someone earlier, and he told me this is used to bag the products. Let's say diesel, bag the products, and then they leave of course, uh, there's a footpath here, wide enough for vehicles, not for large trucks, but motorcycles also. So this is the sad situation here. Looking over there, the cameras can't go that far because of the charred remains of youth who had come here not knowing that they would meet their Waterloo. Now this is the interesting aspect conflicting figures of those who must have died here on Friday. Some said 100, 102, 235 as at yesterday. But what we're hearing today is mind-blowing. Sometimes little children or people that don't have work come here to tie cellophane, to work for people while there are other people called buyers. They normally stay here to buy products, then go to their normal location and refine them to kerosene and diesel. So what brought about the fire? We had that it was a local fire that came out from where they were refining the products. So it caught, the fire caught up with the gas here. So everybody that was in here got rounded by the fire and no single soul escaped unless the ones that were sitting aside but the ones that stayed here almost four to five hundred people here they got burnt and none of them escaped and from what we are hearing because this place is controlled by a deity from what we are hearing here is that anybody that the fire touch even if it touches you in your finger that you're not going to survive even if you go to the highest hospital in this world you're not going to survive this is an abandoned motorcycle two days after the incident. The owner may have been a casualty of the fire that engulfed this little part of the forest. Here is where people come for their business, like for their normal crude business. When the event struck, like sewers had been carried away, you saw the damages on properties like vehicles, you see lives, you see women, married women, pregnant women. When we are talking about 200 or 100, it should be under estimation. We're calculating of 500 to 600. Because in there in the villages, a lot of souls, like a lot of gaskets, were buried. Even some are under conditions which we can precise that they will be alive till tomorrow. So from my community, we should be counting of 100 or 200 that were buried. What about the other communities? What about the neighboring communities? What about those who have not been able to actualize their location? Like a sister, has been, we've been searching for her, we've not gotten her location, we've not gotten her address. Called her number for some time and we're not able to get to them. So this is another disaster that has struck even my people. My community, we are looking for about 100 and I don't know about other communities, but so many souls, if you look at this place now, you can see that so many people have been born like born ashes. You cannot recognize any of them. So the number we can see, you can just manage anyhow. We can't pre predict any number any longer. You can say 500 or 600, so many of them. Who can their deaths? 
Many bodies have been evacuated, yet more lying on the ground, burnt beyond recognition, while the whereabouts of many are unknown. The smoke dies out, leaving vestiges of pain, sorrow and tears in the eyes of the affected Ohajebima communities of Imo State. Ovietime George, Arise News. All right, uh, joining us to uh, discuss uh, further is the founder and CEO of RTC Advisory, Mr. Okwemi Agbaje. Good morning, sir. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, and um, I wanted to get your take on what we've seen so far as far as uh, your reaction to this. Uh, it's a tragedy, and um, it's, it's symptomatic of what is now clearly an evident failure, I think, of governance itself. Uh, that was a large scale operation we saw, covering multiple villages in a community. There were buyers and sellers, there were producers in large numbers. The Nigerian states, the state government, the local government, the security agencies, the police, SSS, could not claim to have been unaware of what was going on. And if they claimed to have been unaware, then they, 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 have, they are affirming that they are incompetent and they are dysfunctional. So there is also a part of, of this because we've had several in recent times. The we've seen the reality of the scale of the legal refining, the oil theft, and all of that. I mean, to the point where a, a CEO is not used to get getting involved in political controversies. Uh, the, the the CEO of the the chairman of UBA mm. spoke out. Um, Surprisingly, from my point of view about it, which alerted the whole country to the scale of the problem. Now, we're hearing figures that in some, in some operations, the degree of theft is as high as 80%. Maybe that's not general for my own investigations in the sector. In some other places, maybe lower. But, but, but that tells you that this is now organized crime. And this is now an activity that has compromised all the institutions that should prevent it, which means there is, there is involvement of elements of security, elements of government, elements of the oil industry themselves. And so we, we is another manifestation, it's not the first, but is another manifestation of the fact that governance across security, across regulation, across um, all of intelligence, that there's a, there's a failure. And if we're not careful, we'll be dealing with a situation in which Nigeria itself is more or less a criminal enterprise. Mm. Um, there's uh, on the front page of today's This Day newspaper, there was a report that the Nigerian, in fact, yeah, you have it right there in front of mm. you. The Nigerian Navy has seized about six million um, liters of uh, illegal crude. So it's the, there's an operation that's been commenced. You know, the president sent Chief Timmy Presilva and all that, you know, um, the Chief of Defense, Lucky Raba, so on and so forth. So what do you make of that? Well, that's a good sign. It's, a, it's, it's our way of responding to things only when they become a major crisis, but better late than never. Uh, that's a good sign. Like I said, the, f the speed of the, of the discovery and of the action and the, and the results suggests that we always knew what was going on. We always knew where they were. We always knew uh, what we could do about it. But maybe there was so much money going around the system that we lack the capacity to act or the incentives to act. But now that there's um, leadership from the top, there's somebody saying, go and get this sorted. I hope that this is not episodic. I hope this is concerted and unrelenting until the whole problem of oil theft, illegal refining, all of the associated activities is um, totally suppressed yeah. and subdued. So going forward, what, what do you think the solution is? How to, to clamp down on oil theft? The, 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 the solution is, yes, um, just like other aspects of, um, of, of, of the failure of security and governance in Nigeria. I think at the end of the day, the ultimate solution, as I've come to define it, 
is that we need some kind of miracle of leadership. I call it a miracle because uh, we haven't had it for so long, but we need um, leadership to step up to the plate on a day-to-day -day basis across factors. I mean, we're, we're having uh, what some are already defining as certainly a failing state. Mm. And it's so that's why I keep saying this, just one more manifestation. So you have breakdown of law and order and governance and security in the Northwest to what we call bandits, which are actually terrorists. We have the failure of security and governance in the Northeast. We have significant manifestations of the same thing in the North Central. We have this, which has apparently become an epidemic of oil theft and illegal refining in the South-South, mostly, but evidently from this crisis, even from parts of the Southeast as well, the oil-producing parts of the Southeast. And you may argue, even though that this region of the country seems the most quiet, but we have large numbers of touts and uh, lawless people who are engaged, fortunately, in profitable activity doing agbero and other activities. So for now, they're not tormenting our lives. So, so we need leadership to step up to governing, to dealing with security, to dealing with intelligence, to doing the things that government is supposed to do. Um, when, when six million liters of stolen crude is seized, that's a breakdown of systems. We do thank you for your time, Mr. Okwayemi Agbaje, CEO, founder and CEO of RTC uh, Advisory. Actually, we're going to take a break. I think we're going to keep you around. We want to talk some more about the emerging markets and the pressures that they're facing. So do stick around. It's the Global Business Report here on Arise News. Do stay tuned. Welcome back to the Global Business Report on Arise News. All right, we still have uh, uh, Mr. Okwayemi Agbaje, who's been kind enough to, to stick around for a few more minutes because I want to pick his brain on some other matters. Founder and uh, CEO of RTC Advisory. Um, Bloomberg Economics has pointed out five nations, emerging markets that are facing um, pressures. I think the Ethiopia, Tunisia, El Salvador, uh, Pakistan, Ghana, yeah. And looking at their bond yields and then um, debt uh, to GDP, I, can you talk about the challenges that emerging markets, Nigeria is in this, you know, mm -hmm. in, in this discussion as well, are facing? Well, we, in, in the immediate term, um, we've had um, two external shocks, all, all emerging markets. Indeed, the world, the impact on emerging markets has just been more severe. And that's the COVID pandemic and then the Ukraine-Russia war, with consequences of each. Uh, let me say up front that I argued at the time mm. that African and emerging economies responded to COVID the same manner the Western economies responded to COVID, policy responses, mm. as if we were the same. Whereas we lacked the fiscal capacity, the, the social welfare capacity, the economic capacity generally, even the government structures to deliver palliatives to people. So we, we took the same measures, lockdowns, uh, all of those things, many of which were inappropriate to emerging markets because we didn't have the cap economic capacity to withstand them. So, but we, we did what we did. And then we now have the Ukraine-Russia war, which mm. has had, um, in particular, two significant impacts on on, on global economies in terms of energy costs and, and, and even food and commodity prices. Those are in the near term. I would argue that emerging markets have been facing a series of external shocks going back to the 2008-2009 financial, global financial crisis and then the oil price crisis of 2014-15 for those who are oil producers and before we now had this... Um, uh, COVID and, and you. So we, if, you, if you take Nigeria, which is not on that list, but we, we've never fully recovered from any of them, right. I would argue. Okay. Even first from the financial crisis, we, were, we had devaluation, we had this, and then we didn't fully recover. Then we had the oil price shock, a second round of devaluation, a second round of um, unemployment and poverty increases and, and fiscal issues, and then COVID, and then Russia. So the, the global economies um, have been, have been, have been imagine the market economies have been taking those shocks over and over. And for, if you look at those five countries that were highlighted, 
I would argue, uh, and I did write about this a week ago, a few days ago. Okay. And I would argue that there were two, only two reasons why Nigeria, for instance, is not on that list. Yeah. One, it's a bigger economy. Mm. So you see, these are relatively smaller economies. Yeah. A scale always matters. If you're bigger, you can refinance. You can. You, you, it takes time uh, to get to default and all of that. But the second and the most critical reason why a country like Nigeria is not there is, is because the, the analysts are focused on debt to GDP. Right, right. And when you look at Nigeria's debt to GDP, I, I did a quick check again just before I came into the studio, and, and Ghana is around 80%. Yes. And we are at worst, I think, Under 35, yeah. 36%. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because we have... A bigger economy and relative to the size of our economy, um, debt to GDP does not appear problematic. The problem from the Nigerian point of view is that, and I've argued similar, uh, same point for decades, uh, or at least for 10 years, that maybe debt to GDP is an erroneous measure for a Nigeria to focus on. Why? Because our GDP does not produce the resources from which we service our debts. We mm. basically sell oil. Right. And therefore, a more appropriate, you're, where you're going. A more yeah. appropriate uh, index for us to focus on, which might be more worrying, is revenue over debt service, debt service yeah. over revenue. Right. And if, 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 if you focus on that, Nigeria will be on top of the list. Mm. Uh, so, so, but it's good for us that the world focuses on debt GDP, probably gives us some space to tidy up ourselves, but, but we must not assume that the problems that Sri Lanka and Ghana and Pakistan mm. and so on are facing are far from us. We have fiscal challenges. Our debt service to revenue is approaching 100%. Mm. We thank you so much for your time, sir. Mr. Akbar Emir Baje, founder, CEO of RTC Advisory. I hope to have you back. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you very much.